Right now, we're going to talk about embrace new realities. Embracing new realities. It's part two of a series, Dreams and Visions in 2021. We started it last week, and we saw that dreams and visions are the language of the Holy Spirit. They're the language of the fourth dimension, that creative spiritual realm that the Holy Spirit at creation brought order into chaos. There was darkness, but the Holy Spirit brought light. He brooded over the darkness. He brooded over the the chaos. And he brought about out of that spirit realm, out of the fourth dimension, and he created in their natural realm. We call it the three-dimensional world that we live in, the world of our senses. He created order. He created light. And then we looked at the prophecy from the prophet Joel, who said that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh, and, and young men would dream dreams. And, and uh, old men would dream dreams and young men would see visions. And, and we saw how visions and dreams, they are the language of the Holy Spirit and they're the language of the fourth dimension. And we saw how dreams and visions are the ability to see creatively beyond the natural realm, the three-dimensional realm that we live in of our senses. The, the visions and dreams from the Holy Spirit are the ability to see creatively beyond the limitations we face in life, the, 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 the world we live in, the, the visions and dreams are the ability to see beyond creatively, to see that which is limited becoming unlimited. All things are possible in Christ, the scripture says, and we have the ability to see it through visions and dreams cooperating with the Holy Spirit. And then we saw how our imagination is a, a key instrument in how visions and dreams, dreams and visions operate in our lives. Our imagination, our imagination is a powerful tool. It's a tool that the Holy Spirit transforms and sanctifies and, and allow, allows our imagination to transform our natural world, our, our three-dimensional world that we live in, to, to bring order into chaos, out of chaos or to bring light out into darkness and to transform the world that we see. We We saw how Abraham, God worked within his imagination. God gave him a dream of being a father of many nations, gave him a dream of uh, of being wealthy, having silver and gold. But before those promises came about, God gave him a dream. He spoke to him through visions and dreams and worked within his imagination. He showed him stars and said, I want you to imagine these stars being your children. He showed him the land. He said, look to the north, the south, the east, and the west, and imagine that this land is yours. And then he changed his name from Abe to Abraham. Abraham, which meant father of many nations, so that when he heard his name, his imagination would be activated and he would see himself differently. He would see himself as a father of, a, of many nations. The imagination, it's a powerful tool. It's a tool that can be used for good or evil. The enemy comes and tries to trap us in negative imaginations, evil imaginations. But God gave us Christ and through the Holy Spirit sanctifies our imagination, enlightens our imagination, and allows our imagination to to imagine God's dreams for our lives, God's vision, the promises of God in Christ Jesus. Our imagination has the ability to to be captivated by that, to lock into it, and to allow that the images to burn within our imaginations. And like Abraham, begin to cooperate. God gave us the Holy Spirit to breathe life into our imagination for our lives, for our families. It's possible in 2021 that the dream and vision that you have or had for your life is broken. Maybe it's barren. The scripture, it, 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 the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and breathed life into the disciples, gave them the ability to dream dreams and to have visions. But the same Holy Spirit is with us today. And I, He is here today with you. Not in a physical building. He's with you now to breathe life into your vision, to breathe fresh vision, fresh imagination. You may have given up on it because of the circumstances, but recognize this, the same Holy Spirit who brought order out of chaos from the fourth dimensional realm into the three-dimensional realm of our senses is the same Holy Spirit who is with you now, and He is speaking, and He's breathing life into your vision, to your imagination, to see things differently. You know, I was talking to our communicating with a member here in our church this week, and she said, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm in the valley of despondency. Everywhere I turn, there's limitations. There's, there's, there's problems. I feel like the, my energy for fighting, my energy for fighting that good fight of faith, it feels, she said, I feel like it's being sucked out of me. I prophesy to you, but I prophesy to each of us watching 
that the Holy Spirit is at work now within your spirit man to energize, to reinvigorate. The scripture says that they that wait on the Lord, they shall mount up on wings like eagles. They're, they're, they, they shall be renewed with strength. And that is happening even now as this gospel message is preached. You know, thinking about Abraham, Abraham had a, had a grandson. His name was Jacob. And Jacob was a natural dreamer. He was a natural dreamer, but at the outset of his life, as a young man, Jacob was not somebody that you'd want to be in business with. He was not a business partner you would want to have in your business endeavors. He was a deceiver. He was a deceitful young man. Now, the deceit was, I'm not saying that's, a, obviously deceit is not a good thing, and he, he initially paid a price for that deceit. He, he had to leave his home. He was chased by his own brother out of, his, out of his home. He was on the run, and then he ended up working for his uncle, who ended up deceiving him too. And yet within it all, within the mess of it all, God came to Jacob, and he gave, planted a new dream, a new vision within his heart, within his mind, within his imagination that transformed his life. See, this message that I'm speaking today is not just for perfect people. It's for people who you may be messed up, even of your own making. Jacob was kind of messed up of his own making. And yet God taught him, like his grandfather Abraham, God taught Jacob the power of visions and dreams and of using his imagination. And we're about to see how transformation happened in his life. Jacob was on the run from his brother Esau. He had deceived his brother Esau out of a birthright. And Esau was on, on route to get Jacob. So Jacob took off. And the scripture says he came to a place called Bethel. Now Bethel, coincidentally, I don't think it's coincidence, but, but coincidentally, Bethel's the same place where Jacob's great-grandfather Abraham first came to when he left his home in Haran on this journey of following after God's vision and purpose for his life. And it was at Bethel where God began to speak visions and dreams to Abraham, but it was here at Bethel where the deceiver Jacob, Abraham's grandson, where God began to birth a dream and a vision in his heart to succeed, to prosper, but now not through deceit, but through God's plans and God's purposes for his life. Let's look at that in Genesis chapter 28, and it says, And he, Jacob, had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching the heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then behold, the Lord was standing above it, and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, uh, uh, of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south, and if you and your descendants shall, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Sounds very similar to the vision and dream God gave his grandfather Abraham, didn't it? And he goes on and he says, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. God plants a vision and a dream in Jacob's life at this moment, and he begins to show him the, the, a different path for his life. He begins to show him a transformed life. But, and like his, great -grandf or his grandfather Abraham, God started working in his imagination, in his visions and dreams. Jacob goes on, and a little bit later on, he finds himself working for his uncle Laban. Now Laban, he's a, also a deceitful kind of business partner, and he deceives Jacob numerous times. Uh, one classic story of deceit was when Jacob worked for four years to marry his uh, Laban's daughter Rachel, and Laban deceived him and gave him Leah. He worked another four years and, and was able to marry Rachel. But also ten times Laban changed his wages on him. This was a this was less than advantageous work environment if if you've ever seen one. So Jacob decided, I need something better for my life. This isn't the dream and vision God placed in my life. But, 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 and so he decided, I'm going to start out in my own business venture. And so he, he came up with a plan. Not a deceitful plan, but a plan. And he proposed it to Laban. And he said, here's my plan, Laban. I will work for you for free. But what I want is I want to get all the speckled goats and all the speckled flock that you have, when I watch over your goats and your sheep, he said, I want to be able to take all the speckled ones from the herd. Now, speckled ones were the weak ones. They were the, they were the ones that you don't want. They're not as valuable. They're weak. They're not, and they're not going to breed as well. And, and so, 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 
uh, Jacob said, listen, all I want is the speckled ones. It'd be almost like if, you are, if you're a salesperson and there's a certain part of the city that sales, there are no sales. You can't get, it's a dead zone. And, and you go to your, employ, your, your employer and say, listen, I, I will take that sales zone I, and I will have no base salary but I want all the profits that come in from that area. Now your employer will say, well, there's no sale. It will think there's no sales there anyhow. You can take all the profits because there's zero to start with. And so Laban says, yeah, sure, Jacob, you can take all the speckled flock. Absolutely. In, in Laban's mind, he's thinking, Jacob, you're going to be working for me forever for free because nobody wants the speckled, flo- f- uh, speckled goats. They are the, they're not the desirable ones. They're the weak ones. They're not, so, they're not, any, they're not any good. But Jacob understood the power of imagination. He understood the power of dreams and visions in his heart that God had given to him. And so what he does, in fact, he tells us what he does. In Genesis chapter 31 and verse 10, Jacob in his own mouth says, And it came about at the time when the flocks were breeding that I raised up my eyes and I saw in a dream and behold, the male goats were mating and stripe, were mating, were striped, speckled and spotted and spotted. Now, Notice he wasn't asleep per se. He says, I dreamed. He was working. He was working. But while he was working, he was dreaming and he was seeing. In other words, as the pure flock, Laban's pure flock, the desirable flock, as they were drinking, Jacob was tending them. That was his job. But he began to visualize. He began to imagine. According to the vision and dream that God had put in his heart, he began to see them conceiving speckled flocks. And he he even went so far as he took a piece of a, a, a branch and he carved some notches into it so it looked like a speckled rod. And as they were drinking and as they were conceiving, he would look at that rod, why? To focus his vision, to focus his imagination in on the promise. He used that tool of a a branch. And the result in time was that those pure flock began to breed speckled flock and the speckled flock became bigger than the pure flock and Jacob became very blessed and he became prosperous and 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 the promises of God began to be fulfilled in his life. But notice how it started in Bethel with a vision and a dream. And then Jacob cooperated with that vision and dream by allowing his imagination to be captivated by the promise, even when it seemed like in the natural circumstances, the odds were against him. He kept being deceived time and time again by his employer, but he understood that the power of of a vision and dream captivating our imagination has the power to transcend the natural limitations or circumstances circumstances that we find ourselves find ourselves in in life and watch this Jacob was even before the new covenant you and I live in this new covenant when the Holy Spirit has been poured out in us the same spirit that Joel said you'll dream dreams and you'll 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 have visions the same power abides in each of our lives today. It could be in 2021, you feel like you've been gypped by life, gypped by society. It's unfair in your circumstance that you're you're facing. The power of visions and dreams, the power of the imagination captivated by the promises of God has the power to transcend whatever circumstance we face today. Visions and dreams of the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful thing. The imagination dreams. Now catch this, I want to be very clear. I noticed when Jacob was, he was working and he dreamed. It's very important when we talk about dreams to recognize that dreams are not idle dreams. Sometimes when you talk about a dreamer, you think of a lazy person. God's types of dreams and visions is not laziness by any stretch. Notice how Lot dreamt while he worked. He worked and he dreamt. In other words, as he worked, he imagined things changing. He was captivated by the promise as he worked. And, and, and in my, I was reflecting on my own life. When I was filled with the Spirit, the number one uh, uh, response in my heart was a spiritual hunger. I had a hunger to know God. I had a hunger to know Him more in the Scriptures and in the Word. But there was something very practical that transformed in my life as well. It just, in how I lived my life, in the practicum of daily life, things transformed in my life. Things changed in my life. And it, it began to matter. Everything that I set my hand to became a part of this partnership with God and through my imaginations and dreams. In fact, even so practical, I was recall, I was filled with the Spirit going into my grade 12 year. 
And, and so, you know, I, I, would, I, I haven't even told, Megan doesn't even know this illustration. I just was digging through some boxes a while back, and I came through this, this plaque. In fact, I have it here. I'm holding it right now. Now, this plaque was given to me after my grade 12 year. I was filled with the Spirit going into grade 12. I was given this at the end of grade 12. And, and notice the number one thing was spiritual hunger. I wanted to know God more. But it, I see how it made a change even in my education, even in my, the trajectory of what I, how I, uh, the motivation that I had in life. Because what is this? You know what this, this says? It's hard to read it, I know, on camera. It says, most improved student in grade 12. I'm not saying that to brag on me. Obviously, I had a low, bar low, I had a low place to start from. I, that, so that's not a good thing. But, but, but when I, I see how when the Holy Spirit came and captivated me with v dreams and visions, began to put this, the, the, the Spirit-led imaginations within me. It even changed my motivation at school. I became better in scholastics. I became motivated to make something with my, with my life. And we see how dreams and visions, they don't make us lazy, but they captivate us. They energize us. And, and, and I say this today because sometimes I fear that people uh, don't find significance in everyday life. Maybe take work. You know, we spend, a lot of people spend, we all spend a lot of hours at work. And, and many people are looking for significance in their work. You spend a long hours there, but what's the point? And sometimes people say, well, I wish I could be Pastor Peter over, you know, in other parts of the world uh, preaching. That's significant. But what I'm doing is, is insignificant. You see, what we see from the story of Jacob and through countless stories throughout the Scripture is that our work, and I'm not talking about works to please God, works in grace. I'm talking about our works of our hands. Our work is a partnership with God in a creative process. In other words, everything that we set our hands to do is a partnership with God in a creative process. And God wants, God works through our hands to create. The scripture says that we are co-laborers with God. And yes, that's Pastor Peter over in, in Asia or Africa preaching, but that's each of us. Whatever we set our hands to do, we are co-laborers. He is working with us and through us. And it starts in our imagination. We become captivated by his visions and the vision and dream he has for us. Maybe you're an accountant. Maybe you're a bookkeeper. You know that God has a vision. God wants to captivate your imagination so that you see when you're crunching numbers, when you're doing your year end, when you're balancing or re re reconciling your accounts, that you're the most accurate. That you, that you come up with ideas how to save your business uh, money, how you find creative ways of new revenue streams. You say, well, that's, yeah, what kind of, I want to be a preacher over in Africa. No, what you're doing is just as much God working creatively through you and your hands and your mind, just like Jacob, as much as, as, much as a preacher. You're, you're called to do what you're doing. You're a king, as we preached earlier this year or last year now. You're a king on this earth, and God's working through you. See, what happens is when we begin to view our lives in this perspective, perspective, it elevates the mundane into the holy. You know what you're doing at work in your sales, at your accounting work, maybe you're in a lawyer or a doctor, maybe you work at Walmart or at, or at Home Depot, whatever it is that you do, it's a holy act with God. It's a partnership with God. God's at work with you in a creative process and the Holy Spirit is with you to captivate your imagination, to see yourself improving, to see yourself exceeding, excelling, and to see your influence widening. In other words, you could also say that our work is part of our worship. I mean, there's many things we do to worship God, but our work is part of our worship to God. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, watch this, it says, it says, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to keep it. To work and to keep it. This word work has nothing to do about pleasing God. This is the works of our hands. Now, in Hebrew, the word for work is the same that they use for worship. Work and worship, work and worship. As, but, but when we begin to see how God has partnered with us, with our minds, our, our creativity, our intelligence, and, our, and, and everything that we set our hands to do, and part, part of the blessing of Abraham is that he blessed the works of our hands. When we begin to see it, it elevates what we do into the realm of the holy. We begin to see how God's working with me. And so it's so important, you see, when we begin to see it from this perspective, money even takes on a whole new meaning. You know, Wealth or money is a means of partnering with God to allow his kingdom to expand on this earth through the preaching of the gospel. I'll say it again. You can see it on the screen. Wealth is a means to partnering with God to bring about his kingdom on earth through preaching of the, 
of the gospel. It takes resources. It takes financial means. It takes, it takes wealth. If you think about the Good Samaritan for a moment. You know, we love the Good Samaritan. He helped the man who was, who was, who was hurting. He was helped the man who, was, who, who had been attacked. But you know, that good, that good Samaritan obviously had good intentions, but good intentions were not enough. That good, that good Samaritan, he dressed his wounds and he put him in an inn so that he could be healed. I, it's the same as now. Inns cost money. We need wealth. We need resources. You and I, we need resources to be able to work the, 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 the mercy of God, to preach the gospel, to help people without resources. It's impossible. All the good intentions in the world will not get the job. Good intentions are important, but the good Samaritan, he needed resources. You see, when we begin to see this cooperation and this partnership, we begin to see that the accumulation of wealth, so many times wealth is looked on as evil. But when we begin to see that our work and our wealth and our resources, our partnership with God for his kingdom to be, to be brought about on earth, the preaching of the gospel, we begin to see that the accumulation of wealth is a virtue, a virtuous thing if viewed in the, in the light of partnership with God. See, money itself is not moral or immoral. It's not more, it depends whose hands it's in. If money is in an immoral person's hand, then money will be used for immoral purposes. If, but if money is in the hands of a moral person, a good, a righteous person, money will be used for moral, righteous, righteous purposes. You see, that's how Jacob viewed his partnership with God. We already saw how God birthed the, birthed the dream and a vision in his heart. How, like his father Abraham, he would continue to be, be a father of many nations. And how the, the land from the east, the west, the south, the east, he would, in other words, his, expand, his influence would be expanded. God would make his name great and he would prosper him in silver and gold. And, and then we saw how Jacob partnered with him in his imagination, seeing himself prospering, seeing himself succeeding. It, it, you know, he could have thought, I'm just tending sheep. It's such a mundane thing. But no, he saw how God was multiplying his flock, how God was bringing about speckled sheep even when there shouldn't have been any speckled. And he saw God prospering. And that power, that vision and dream captivating his imagination prospered him. But you see, God works in the same way in our hearts today. Most people aren't preachers. Most people, most of us, and long before I was a preacher, I worked many years. Many of you know my story. Many years before, without preaching. But so, so, so if God only works creatively through preachers, heaven help the rest of us. But no, God works through each of our hands. And he wants us to be captivated by this dream of our father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. How God wants to prosper, expand on our influence. Why? Because we need resources in our hands to to. to to finance the work of the gospel. Now, and we know that Jacob had this view of his partnership with God. In fact, in Genesis 28, Jacob, he made a vow. In Genesis 28, that was the same passage where God gave visions and dreams to his heart. And Jacob responded like this. He said in verse 20, he made a vow and he said it, if God be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and give me food to eat and garments to wear, I return, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a memorial stone will be God's house. And of everything that you give me, God, I will give you a tent. In other words, Jacob saw how God wanted to prosper him. He saw how God worked through him. He saw how that, this, this creative power would captivate him. And he saw how he was in partnership financially with God. And he, God used his imagination. Jacob cooperated and allowed his imagination to be used to prosper him in the area of finance. You know, I was so encouraged by one of our church members last year, I guess. We've just changed the calendar year, but it's been a very recent story. We were praying for a job for this church member. And I remember this church member, you know, they said to me, they said, they, 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 they said well, let's pray for a job. But I, and I remember this person. You know, they didn't sit idly dreaming. You know, again, as I said, dreaming, you know, dreams and visions are not idle. Jacob dreamt and he imagined while he worked or while he got active. And in Genesis 28, nothing had changed yet, but he made the vow to God, God, I'm a partner with you. I'll give you a tenth of everything. And I remember this member so encouraged me that, that, that even though they had lost their job, they were laid off and looking. They, 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 they said, you know, I'm going to keep sowing my seed. I'm going to keep giving my offerings. They didn't give as much. They didn't have as much, but they gave what they had. They said, I view myself as a partner, so I'm going to keep partnering. You know, they got a job just within the last month, a good job, a very good job. And, 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 and they said to me, they, they, they made this quote, and I even put it on screen. I think it speaks powerfully to our lives today. They said, I know, this is a quote from our church member, I know it's the will of God for me to work. 
Number one, to provide for, our, for my needs. And number two, for the needs of the Lord's gospel ministry. In other words, this, this person saw, this person sees, as part of our church, sees themselves as a partner with God. And I've seen how, yes, 2020 took their job from them. But they didn't stop imagining that they were a partner with God. They didn't stop being active, saying, I may not have as much to give, but I'm going to keep giving what little that I have. They kept being active there, and I've seen God's faithfulness. This person got a job, in fact, the job that kind of exceeded even my expectations, but they viewed themselves as a partner, yes, to provide for their needs, but also to provide for the work of the ministry. God worked within them, captivating them, captivating their imagination to see that God flowing through them creatively. God wants to use our imaginations to prosper us. Our work is like our worship. What could you do with resources? So many people in our church family have good intentions, maybe, but, 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 but maybe God wants to, to, to use your hands to finance a new Bible school. You've heard this, this ministry in this church talking about launching a new Bible school uh, this year in Indonesia, a second one. But, but could it be that God wants to use your hands? You say, I'm just an accountant. I'm just, a, uh, I'm just, a, I'm just working here. I'm just doing this and that. I, uh, but maybe it is that God wants to, number one, exceed your expectations and you excelling at your place of work, and then using the resources that God blesses you with to start a new Bible school. Or, or, or maybe it is to, 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 to build a new wing of the, of the building for, for youth and children, or, or it could be to finance a, a gospel campaign. You're captivated by, these, by the gospel campaigns around the world that Pastor Peter does. I want to find, you know, there was a member just this year in our church. That, I think it was, it was in March, just when the lockdown started, come banging on the church door that Sunday morning. We weren't having church. I just happened to be there, and this member said, you know, I, I want to, I've had a dream in my heart to finance an entire gospel campaign. She said, you know, I don't have the full finances right now, but I'm giving what I have. And she gave a pretty large donation. It didn't cover a whole campaign, but it covered a great portion of it. I mean, that we start where we have, but it's a partnership with God. And life takes on a, takes on a wonderful meaning. It lifts the mundane into the holy. We begin to see that everything that I do, everything I set my hand to do becomes part of my worship. It becomes holy unto God. And we take on a whole new purpose and destiny. Life becomes energizing. It releases strength and energy. Remember, the visions and dreams, our imagination, have the power to transform our three-dimensional world. They have the power to pull out of the, the unseen realm into the seen realm. And I know this is in fact, this is not the message that I had prepared today. It's come out entirely different. But I realized that in 2021, when finan you hear about financial doom and gloom everywhere due to this pandemic, and their prophet, the news prognosticators are saying it's going to get a whole lot worse. But I tell you, there are resources in God. There are resources in that invisible realm, in that fourth dimension. And God is telling us, tap into that. If ever there is a time to be capped, you know, you can say, well, Nathan, why are you preaching? This is not, this is the time to test, kind of take it easy stroke our backs and become little victims. No, it's not. It's a time to be captivated by the imagination, by, in our imaginations, by the dreams and visions that God has for us. Jacob, he was in, in a circumstance that was entirely limited. His employer changed his wage 10 times illegally on him, and yet he kept on dreaming. He kept seeing a different vision for his, a different vision for his life than the circumstances kept presenting to him. And it could be that your employment, it could be that the circumstances of your life, and I know God has dreams beyond finances today. In fact, I have a whole page here of other kind of circumstances, but this is what we got time for today. It could be that when you look at your life, that at your financial business or well wherewithal, you don't see any long. It, your vision might be barren. It could be, could be broken. It could be buried. God's saying today, let me breathe that fresh vision into you. Let me reinvigorate you. When we have a fresh vigor, vision, we begin to operate in greater creativity, greater strength, greater uh, 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 motivation. We begin to mount up on wings of eagle. That's part of waiting on the Lord. We begin to wait on his dreams and his visions while we were. My encouragement today is this. Let's be captivated by that. I, my last illustration, and then we're going to pray, but, but I remember this ministry, Pastor Peter's ministry. I've been working for it for 21 years now, and about, I forget, a number of years back. There was a gentleman, I, and, and, I, and I, Pastor Peter has told me this story many, many times, and he started out with nothing, nothing. He was almost, I think he was almost had nothing in his hands, and yet God planted a dream in his heart. He wasn't a lazy man. He was an active man, but the circumstances had, had, had put him in less than advantageous circumstances. And so he had put, God put a dream in his heart, and he began to work that dream. And God prospered him in a big way. This man 
He, at the time, he's no longer living, but at the time he was giving over a million dollars a year to the ministry. You know, that can, do, that can finance a lot of campaigns. And I believe that there are people in this church family that God is wanting to do just that. I understand we're all in different circumstances. Maybe you're retired and it doesn't speak entirely to you, or you could be you know, just a young person, but, but you have your future ahead of you. But there are others that God is speaking to. And don't limit just because you're retired. God can also give you ideas how to do creative, many creative things. So let's not be limited by our circumstances. But God is saying, you know, I, I, it's time. This ministry, this church, you know, we have a great vision, great vision to reach the world. We've been blessed with a founding pastor who has vision to reach the, 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 the billions and billions of people of this earth. And this church family is an essential part of that. The scriptures talk about there's a ministry gift of giving. And I believe this is not the year when you'd think that this should happen. But I believe this is the year when God's raising up individuals to be captivated by this vision and dream, to be conduits of finance for the work of the gospel. That this could be even our best year yet. You see, just like the Good Samaritan, good intention are good, but they're not enough. We need resources. But the good news is that God works within us to will and to do His good pleasure. He works starting with a dream and a vision. Maybe you had a dream or a vision for a business. Maybe you had a dream or a vision or a way to make money. You've given up on it because of circumstances. You were talked out of it. Allow the Holy Spirit to breathe fresh vision into your heart today.